Now, in a first aid situation, it's probable at some stage you're going to have to look after a patient who has become unconscious. But before we think about this, let's think what we mean by consciousness. Now, consciousness is generated by the brain. There's a lower part of the brain, the brain stem, that generates consciousness. And then this sends impulses to the upper parts of the brain where consciousness is experienced. So, for example, in the back of your brain, in the area called the occipital lobe, you experience the sensation of vision. In the frontal parts of your brain, you experience social interactions and social activity. At the side of your brain, in the temporal lobes, you experience smell and sound and taste. So all these things are attributes of consciousness. And these are all emergent properties from the way the brain is working. But in order for the brain to work, it must be electrically active. The brain works on electrical activity and it must be adequately perfused with blood because it's the blood that takes the oxygen and the nutrients to the brain to allow this neurological function from which consciousness emerges. But don't worry if you don't fully understand the concept of consciousness, because at the moment no one alive on this planet does fully understand consciousness. But it is absolutely true to say it is an emergent property from the brain. So in unconsciousness, for some reason, the brain is no longer able for a period of time to generate this phenomena of consciousness. Now, at the moment, because you're listening to this and you're aware of this, you are conscious. And you might not realise that you're actually at the moment being protected by a wide spectrum of reflexes that are organised by your nervous system. So, for example, if a fly is going to go into your eye, your eye will automatically shut to protect the delicate surface of the eye beneath the cornea of the eye. Or a fairly common experience is something going down the wrong way. So you're eating and some food or some liquid, instead of going down the food pipe, instead of going down the esophagus towards the stomach, instead of going in this physiological direction, it goes the wrong way and starts to go down into the airway, into the trachea. And this is something that I'm sure you've all experienced. There's a very violent reaction. There's gagging, there's coughing, as these reflexes protect the airway to stop anything going down into the airway. And it's important to realise that in an unconscious patient, these reflexes are lost, so the patient is no longer able to protect themselves. And this means that you as the first aider must account for this and protect the patient. So you need to look after the patient's eyes to make sure they're not damaged. You need to look after the patient's swallowing. You need to make sure the patient's airway is open so that they're not choking. You need to look after the patient's head in case they damage their neck because they're no longer able to control their neck muscles. And in fact, you need to look all around the patient's body to make sure that nothing is damaging them or injuring them. Things they would normally do themselves, voluntarily or via reflexes to protect themselves, they can't do. So the first aider temporarily takes over those responsibilities in the unconscious patient. And one of the important examples of this in first aid is that the patient is no longer able to control their swallowing and their gag reflex will be lost. And this is particularly important if the patient has their head down with their chin towards their chest, because this means that their airway will be closed. So just now, if you put your chin down towards your chest, you will be automatically maintaining your airway by positioning your tongue in your mouth so the air can get through your mouth, back to the tube at the back of your mouth called your pharynx, and then on down to the trachea on down to the airway, which of course goes to the lungs. You're doing that completely automatically. But if someone's unconscious and their head is down, the tongue will close off the airway. And this means that the airway can be blocked, resulting in the death of the individual, simply because they're unconscious and the head is in the wrong position. Because they have lost these reflexes that normally keep their airway open. And then thinking about the gag reflex, if someone's lying on their back and they vomit, the next time they breathe in, <gasps> they're going to inhale the vomit that's already in the back of their mouth down into their lungs, into their trachea, into their airway. And this is a very serious condition. This is called aspiration. And these patients are probably going to develop aspiration pneumonia and they're likely to die from this. So unless you can prevent the inhalation of vomit, then the patient is probably going to die.
So it's massively important to realize that in the unconscious patient, the protective reflexes are lost. So this is where the first aider comes in because immediate action needs to be taken to protect the unconscious patient by correctly managing them. And clearly this is going to involve protecting the airway. The A is the first priority. And of course, as is always the case in the first aid situation, we're going to summon professional help as soon as practically possible. Now, before we look at how to assess the level of consciousness and how to manage the unconscious patient, it's interesting first to think about what are the possible causes of unconsciousness. What can cause someone who is perfectly conscious to become unconscious? Well, a lot of first aid manuals teach the mnemonic fish shaped. And if this helps you to remember the causes of unconsciousness, then that's fine. If you want to use your own method, then that is also fine. But let's think about F-I-S-H first. And the F stands for fainting. Now, a faint occurs when the blood is no longer going to the brain, when the brain is no longer being perfused, for whatever reason. So if the blood is not going to the brain, the brain's not going to be perfused with oxygen. It's not going to get its oxygen supply. And it's not going to get its nutrient supply because the brain needs oxygen and glucose pretty well constantly. Because the brain is a very metabolically active organ. All the individual neurons are metabolically active. There's a lot of biochemistry going on in there all the time to generate activity and consciousness. And to generate this activity, the brain needs a constant supply of nutrients and oxygen in which to oxidize those nutrients to produce the required energy. And if this is cut off for just a few seconds, then the patient will feel unwell and then they will lose consciousness. They will faint. And this is often caused by what we call a vasovagal episode. The vaso part relates to the vagus nerve. And the vagus nerve is what we call a parasympathetic nerve. It's that branch of the nervous system that slows things down. So it slows down the heart rate and it slows down the breathing. And if the heart rate slows enough, it's not going to be pumping out enough blood to perfuse the brain. And the other part of vasovagal is the vaso part. And that stands for vasodilation, which means the blood vessels widen. And if the blood vessels widen, the blood pressure drops. And again, the pressure of the blood is no longer sufficient to perfuse the brain. And this means the patient will fall over. And this is often good because when the patient falls over, it means they're lying flat, which means the blood is no longer pumping uphill to get to the brain. So typically when someone falls over, the brain is reperfused and the patient regains consciousness fairly quickly. So FI, I stands for imbalance of heat. People can become hyperthermic, meaning the body temperature rises, or they can suffer from hypothermia, which means the body temperature drops. And which of these the patient is presenting with will usually be fairly obvious depending on the circumstances. So someone on a hot day walking up a hill in a lot of clothes carrying a pack, they're likely to be hyperthermic. Or someone who's been working in a very hot industrial environment is at risk of hyperthermia, especially if they're dehydrated as well. Whereas if it's a cold day, if someone's out in cold weather, especially if they're wet, or especially if they've been drinking alcohol, then hypothermia is going to be a possibility. And mostly in a first aid situation, these patients won't be unconscious, but they could be very drowsy and very confused. And clearly if someone's too hot, we've got to cool them down. If someone's too cold, we need to warm them up. F-I-S. S is for shock. Now shock means that the blood pressure is so low that the tissues of the body are not perfused. Now in this context, shock does not mean we've got a fright or that we're psychologically shaken up or traumatized. We're talking about physiological shock here where the blood pressure is low. And this can be caused by a variety of conditions. It could be caused by bleeding or extreme dehydration, such as caused by burns or diarrhea or the heart may not be working properly, or the person may have a very severe infection, or it can also happen if someone is suffering from a severe allergic reaction, a so-called anaphylactic reaction, where someone can develop anaphylactic shock. So F-I-S-H, the H stands for head injury. Now, basically there's two ways that someone can lose consciousness after a head injury. The first is if they are knocked out at the time of the injury. So if there's a sudden trauma, the head is injured, 
very often with blunt trauma in the first aid situation. They've either hit their head or something has hit their head. And as a result of this, the patient can become unconscious straight away. They're knocked out at the time of the trauma. And this is caused by concussion. What happens is the brain shakes up inside the skull and the brain bashes on the inside of the skull as a result of the external trauma. And as the brain moves, that shears some of the neurons, some of the nerve fibers in the brain, meaning they don't work sufficiently well to generate consciousness. This is a concussion. And such a person can be unconscious for a second, several seconds, several minutes, up to an hour, several hours, or in severe cases, even days, weeks, or months, or indeed even years, depending on the level of the initial injury. But other people can get head injuries and become unconscious after a period of time when they have been conscious. And this is caused by a secondary head injury. So the initial head injury, for example, might have damaged a blood vessel, which bleeds inside the skull, a so-called intracranial hemorrhage, the bleeding inside the skull. And as this blood leaks out from the blood vessels, it collects in a particular space, and this is called a hematoma, a collection of blood. And the problem with the hematoma is it's nowhere to go, so it compresses the brain. And when the brain is compressed by a certain amount, it's no longer able to generate consciousness, and that person will become unconscious. Now, going on to the shaped part of the mnemonic, S-H-A-P-E-D. The S here stands for stroke. Now, a stroke is a cerebrovascular accident, normally caused by a blood clot in the arteries that are supplying blood to the brain or the arteries which are carrying blood through the brain itself. Or sometimes, less commonly, a stroke can be caused by a bleed into the brain, a so-called hemorrhagic stroke. And the main feature here is that the person becomes weak or paralysed or loses sensation on one side of the body. And of course, in this situation, we need to think fast, face, arms and legs, S for disturbance of speech, and T for time. We need to get them to medical help as soon as we possibly can. Now, having said this, many people who suffer from strokes do not become unconscious. But there can be this element of paralysis in the face or arms or legs often with speech disturbance. But even if only one of those features is present, if there's a droop on one side of the face, or one of the arms or legs become weak, or there's a disturbance in speech, any one of those means we should suspect stroke and seek immediate medical help. Shaped SH is for heart attack. Now in a heart attack, what normally happens is there's a blood clot in one of the arteries supplying the heart the muscle of the heart called the myocardium. And this can upset the muscle of the heart, making it electrically unstable. And it can start giving off lots of electrical impulses, which basically confuse the heart and means that the heart can no longer contract in a coordinated way. And bits of the heart muscle just start contracting all over the place. And instead of contracting in a meaningful way, the heart muscle just quivers. This is called ventricular fibrillation, the ventricles being the lower chambers of the heart, and this fibrillation just being this erratic, uncoordinated movement. And if the heart is not contracting in a coordinated way, then it's not generating the cardiac output that generates the blood pressure. So again, the brain won't be perfused and the patient will become unconscious seconds after the onset of this abnormal heart rhythm. Other patients who have heart attacks just experience severe chest pain. So severe chest pain followed by unconsciousness would be a very strong indicator that this patient has gone into this life-threatening cardiac arrest situation. SHA, the A here is for asphyxia. Now asphyxia means the patient is unable to breathe because the airway is blocked. So the air containing the 21% of oxygen in the atmosphere has to get from the outside environment down into the patient's lungs through the airway. And any blockage of that airway can lead to asphyxia. So the airway could be blocked because the individual is unconscious and the head is tilted forward, or there could be trauma in the mouth causing swelling, or swelling could also be caused by severe allergic reactions. But most commonly in asphyxia, the patient will have inhaled some foreign body, normally something they're eating. So it could be a piece of meat or a boiled sweet that's got stuck in their airway. And here we'd have to instigate the first aid procedures associated with choking. 
so the patient would be very distressed. But after a period of time, if the air is not getting to their lungs, the levels of oxygen in the blood would drop to such a point that the blood is not carrying enough oxygen to the brain to maintain the normal activity of the brain and that person would then become unconscious. And at that stage, they are in an immediate life-threatening situation. Unless something is done very quickly, that individual is likely to die. Carrying on with the shaped, the P is for poisoning. Now, poisons can work in different ways. For example, a poison such as cyanide could affect the heart, meaning the heart is unable to generate the blood pressure, which takes the blood to the brain, meaning the brain would lose consciousness. Or a poison could affect the brain directly. So if someone's taken too much alcohol or too much benzodiazepines or an overdose of opiates. Or another common problem is so-called designer drugs, what used to be called legal highs, particularly synthetic cannabinoids, sometimes called spice, can affect the brain directly, causing unconsciousness. But another situation you could see in the first aid situation is where the blood has been poisoned. And this can happen with carbon monoxide. So if someone is in an internal environment and a car engine is running, any internal combustion engine is running, then it's going to be giving off exhaust fumes. The exhaust fumes are going to contain carbon monoxide. The carbon monoxide will poison the blood, meaning that the blood is no longer able to carry oxygen. Again, therefore starving the brain of oxygen meaning it can't metabolize and generate the consciousness required. S-H-A-P-E, the E here is for epilepsy. Now there's different forms of epilepsy. There can be absent attacks where the patient just loses consciousness for a short period of time, then regains consciousness. Normally not associated with the convulsing movements we often associate with fitting. Or there can be the more serious form of a fit, which is called a tonic-clonic fit. Now, in a tonic-clonic fit, the patient will become rigid. The muscles will become rigid. This is called the tonic phase. And then the muscles will shake. This is called the clonic phase. And after this, there will be a period of coma. So these are the stages of a shaking fit, the tonic, clonic, coma stages. And the patient will become completely unconscious from the very start of the tonic phase until they wake up at the end of the coma phase. And the coma phase could last for seconds, typically a few minutes, but it could last for longer, even some tens of minutes. And when the patient wakes up after this, they're likely to be very confused, groggy, drowsy, feeling unwell. And we normally refer to this as the post-ictal state. After the fit is the post-ictal state. So even when the patient's no longer unconscious, they'll still need looked after because they're likely to be disorientated and confused and unable to look after themselves in the normal way. And the last letter of shaped is D for diabetes. Now in diabetes mellitus, the patient is unable to control their blood sugar levels. Now if the blood sugar levels rise too high, that's usually not too much a problem for the first aider. It's bad because it's going to cause long-term complications in the patient, but usually it's not a first aid presentation. Although if we see someone who's diabetic and they smell of pear drops, if the breath smells of pear drops, this is caused by acetone in the blood, then the patient may be what is referred to as ketotic and that requires immediate medical attention. But most commonly in the first aid situation, the blood glucose levels won't be too high. The patient will not be hyperglycemic. The blood sugar levels will be too low they will be hypoglycemic. And this is normally caused by taking too much insulin or taking other medication that lowers the blood sugar levels. But it can also be caused by exercise and alcohol. Or sometimes it can happen when the patient is unwell and unable to eat. For example, after they vomited the food out of their stomach. So the food which would normally be giving them the carbohydrates and the sugar they require is on the floor or in the basin rather than in their stomach being absorbed. And when the blood sugar level drops, the brain is no longer able to metabolize normally because the brain has to use sugar. The particular sugar involved is called glucose. And we say that the brain is an obligate glucose user. So if the glucose supply to the brain is reduced, the brain is going to be unable to work normally and therefore unable to generate consciousness. So here we've looked at an introduction to consciousness and we've looked at the main causes of unconsciousness thinking about fainting, imbalance of heat, shock, head injury, stroke, heart attack, 
asphyxia, poisoning, epilepsy and diabetes. Now in the next talk we want to think about how we assess the levels of consciousness.